go. So adult programming, um, we have actually five people to present today, so it's going to be kind of really quick and down and dirty. If you have any questions, put them in the text chat box below and we will make sure they get answered. Catherine Stanton will be our first presenter. She's the Adult Services Librarian at Madison uh, Library District. And then Jennifer Henson and Eliza Evans will, from Idaho Falls Public Library will uh, be telling us about their adult programming. Then we have Diane Scott from the Idaho Commission for Libraries who is the Let's Talk About coordinator and she's going to provide some more um, hints on uh, adult programming and getting people to come to you um, or you going to people. Uh, Sue Walker is our Talking Book Service Coordinator here at the Idaho Commission for Libraries and she will also give a short presentation. And finally we have Amelia Velasek from the Career and Technical Education Department and the State of Idaho and she's going to talk about a grant opportunity that is uh, open right now during uh, or will be open in March from now until um, about mid-March uh, and it has to do with adult programming and workforce development services. So without further ado we are going to jump in and get started and with our first presenter. Oh uh, well I have one more one more uh, slide here. Uh, adult program attendance at the Idaho Public Libraries has increased 35% over the past five years. So nice work. Good job on getting those folks into library programming. Um, and this is really definitely shown through our statistics here. Okay, now we are going to turn this over to Catherine uh, Stanton from the um, Madison Library District. Go ahead, Catherine. Hi everybody and greetings from the Madison Library District in Rexburg, Idaho. Um, come visit us anytime. We get really excited about programming here and we especially get excited about our summer reading program. Um, the first week of summer reading we will have over 2,000 people coming through every day. Since we're the youngest town in America it appears um, kids, kids, kids have always been our focus. But seven years ago, I was asked to develop a summer reading program for adults. And since then, I've had a lot of fun doing this. Um, first year, we had about 400 people sign up. Second year, 600. And since then, we've kind of hit our average between 750 and 800 people. So I'm going to very, very, very quickly give you an overview of what we do. And hopefully, there will be a minute or two for questions. Um, my main goals at doing adult summer reading have been to get people reading, to encourage them to read, and to have some nice summer fun. So what happens when people come in the building um, to sign up? We'll have a clipboard. They sign up for summer reading, and they get a summer reading log. Um, in this, they'll keep track of the, the books that they read, the number of pages in the books, and the running total of the pages. Um, the goal is to reach 3,000 pages by the end of our eight-week session. Um, in their log, um, they will have kind of mile markers along the way. And when they reach those mile markers, they'll come in, they'll get a stamp, and they'll get a small prize to kind of give them some incentive along the way. Um, this was one our, our first one. For this one, they had to divide their pages by 10 to get the degrees they were traveling around the world. It wasn't high math, but it was a little confusing for some people. Uh, so if you do this, I would recommend keeping a direct correlation. Spaced units to pages worked well, or just simply pages to pages. Um, now those 3,000 pages for some of our patrons are, it's just a piece of cake for them to go through that. For others, slower readers, it's just an unreachable goal. So inside um, every log, we also have additional activities that they can do to get extra points towards reaching their goal. And this gives the chance for everybody to be able to actually make it if they try. Plus, it makes things more fun. Um, now, we don't want to give the impression that you can do everything with the activities. If you added all of those up, you would still be significantly short of the goal and would have to read a few books anyway. Plus, many of the activities are read a book about or read a book that is set in 
So it encourages them to explore areas they might not be reading in. And because of that, some of them, although wanting to do the goal, will need some suggestions. So we do reading lists every year for those areas that are in the activities. Sometimes they're just individual sheets. In this case, there was a brochure that had reading suggestions. Um, for the ones that are travel-based goals, I also do travel logs that will tell them about the places that they are kind of virtually visiting along the way. And these are really popular. Um, people ask for them, especially the ones that I include recipes in. So food is always possible. Um, prizes along the way are pretty simple. Um, pencils and bookmarks can go a long way. We made a lot of the bookmarks in-house. Um, and then area businesses help. Um, no Hollow Frozen Yogurt always gives us some coupons. And the final prize, Pizza Pie Cafe gives us coupons. And there are you know, toys and games and things along the way that help. Um, if they reach those 3,000 pages and complete summer reading, they'll be entered into drawings for big prizes at the end. And you know the problem with drawings, of course, is that if you get your name drawn, it will only be for something that you do not want, the one, thing, one prize that you don't want. So um, initially, I had them give, gave them 10 little slips of paper that they could put into um, envelopes for the prizes that they wanted, which created a horrible traffic jam and a lot of writing cramps. So um, recently, we have done this, and it works really well. When they complete, they sign out, they give their phone number. And the line that they sign on has a number on it. And then we will give them a little packet that has 10 slips that just has that number on it. And that identifies them. They can just slip it in, and it's really fast. There is a little bit of a traffic jam deciding the prizes. So I make up a sheet that has little pictures, and they can take and look at those and figure it out before they come and put their slips in. Um, kind of backtracking a little bit, like I say, for some people, those 3,000 pages are really, really easy. And I will have a number of people that the middle of the second week will bring their logs in. They've completed everything. And they're complaining because they want more to do because they don't want to be done yet. Um, so the last few years, I've also made an additional challenge, something a little harder. If they finish um, the original reading in the first six weeks, they're eligible for this extra challenge. And they'll have to read 1,500 more pages to get it. Um, again, I give them some activities, but they're not as many, and they're usually a little harder. Um, when we get all done, we do have a final party. And at that point, we'll have the drawings for the big prizes. And uh, you do, don't have to be present to win, but it helps, because I will give people who attend a couple of extra drawing slips. We'll have some cake. We'll have some activities, usually some themed treats and um, do our drawings. Now, one thing that's been really popular the last couple of years, if you look at back at the background of this picture, you can see tables that have books on them. And if your library is like ours, we get a lot of donations. A lot of them we don't use. But some of those that we don't use are really beautiful books. They're in pristine condition. Um, looks like it just came off the bookstore shelf. And I will stockpile those during the year. Um, by the end of summer reading, I usually have a couple of hundred. And so anybody who attends will get a couple of free books to take home as well, even if they don't win the drawing prize, which makes everybody go home with a smile and a little added incentive to go home and read. So that's what we've got in a nutshell. <laughs> Whew, I talked fast. Um, any questions? Hey, 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 it looks like how do you market your adult summer reading program? Well, with us, like I say, we've got 2,000 people coming in every day beginning of the summer, most of them with small children. Um, so as they sign up, bring the children in to sign up, we say, oh, and by, doesn't mom want to sign up as well? Um, so that's probably the biggest, the biggest way we draw people in. Um, the flyers and things that we will take to the schools 
Um, we'll also have maybe a little blurb on the back about the parent signing up. Um, we usually put in a newspaper article. We'll put it on Facebook. Um, yeah, those are our, our main channels. Catherine, do you just have an... Sure. So asking those people... I'm sorry, I missed the last of your question, yeah, Shirley. Making sure you ask those people when they come in with their... Yeah. That's great. That's... Um, so, Catherine, there's one other question. Uh -huh. Do you have an adult party or just or combine it with other contestants? We have you, an adult party. have an adult party. party, or is that combined with other activities? With, like, the teens and the children's party? Um, we just do adults, and I, on the invitations, I will specify this is adult only. It's kind of nice, especially in Rexburg, which is so kid-centric, to have something that is just for big people. And once you have one child who sneaks in, it suddenly becomes all about that child. So yeah, this, this is for grown-ups, and I, I think the grown-ups attending really appreciate that. Um, we kind of, at the final party, we usually have 30 to 40 until last year, and I think having those giveaway books really made the difference. We had close to 100 last year and had trouble fitting everybody in. So, yeah, give, make sure everybody has, has a little something and make it just, just for the adults. That's great. Okay. Um, well, there's one more question. Let me ask you more. So, Alexi asks, do you do specific things for millennials, young single adults, or is it all family friendly? <laughs> Good question. Um, we do have um, programs for teens as well as children. Once they hit 18, they go into the adult program. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's not necessarily, you don't have to be 50 to do it. You, the books that you read are your choice. The activities um, you can or cannot participate in, again, your choice. And a lot of them I make activities that you might want to do with your family. Um, so. OK. I'm just wanting to make sure. Good. OK, great. Yeah. I, everyone can hear me. Perfect. OK. So this is how we're going to do it. I'm talking, and Lisa is going to be taking questions in the chat room. Does that make sense? That's awesome. Thank you. OK. I'm going to put this a little bit to my mouth a little bit more lightly, and then you can hear me maybe. OK. So we are going to talk about Extreme Book Nerd, which is our most popular and our most, OK. I see that you guys can barely hear me. This is the most popular program. It is a year-long reading program that we started a couple years ago. And we got it from a list in off of Facebook. How do I, oh, there we go. So like it says, uh, it was inspired from a list from Pop Sugar in almost th three years ago. It is our most popular program. We do summer reading for adults and young adults. We do winter reading for young adults and adults. We do blind date with the book all through the month of February. We do uh, Let's Talk About It programs. We do a lot of programming at the Idaho Falls Public Library, but this, this is our most popular program. We I think that's better. Let's go. OK. So, like I said, most popular program, we have it for adults and teens, and now the children's department does one as well. So the rules are listed here. Basically, it's 50 books in 50 weeks. I one book per week, or as many as it takes to get 50 books read within the time frame. Um, this year, we end on the 21st. We always end right before Christmas. 
That way it is exactly 50 weeks from the time we started. In the first year, we did do 52 books because we included a trilogy. But we've cut that out. And I'll show you the book list again on the next page here. Actually, I'm going to talk about prizes. Right here, these are the prizes we've offered, um, which really seems to drive up uh, participation. The first year, we did that red hoodie. And you can see the categories are listed on the back. So it's kind of like a concert t-shirt. Turns out pretty cool. This year, 2016, we did the green bag. And uh, next, 2017, we're doing the blue sweatshirt. Guys, I'm sorry about the headset. It worked fine earlier. So in the first year, we signed up over 1,000 people. We had uh, 33 or 300 people finish. They got the hoodie. What we learned is that we really need to stress the end date. We had people who weren't paying attention to their handouts. And we had a flurry of people who were unhappy that it wasn't what they thought the end date was, even though we said what the end date was when we started. Um, Really small. You can see all the categories for that first year. This is the year we included the trilogy, so it was 52 books. We've since changed. 2016, we're down a little bit. We think it was the green bag. People were interested in the bag. Um, but we still had good numbers and good finishers. This year, we are. As of last week, we're almost 800 people signed up. Uh, obviously, we don't know who's finished yet, but we do have people finish as early as June. Liza, June is right, right? Um, but really early. Um, it's a hoodie again, like I showed you. It's a green, zip, or sorry, a blue zip-up hoodie that people seem to be really interested in, rather than the bags. Oh, thanks, Liza. In February. So uh, we fund it with library funds. Um, something we've learned this year that already in just the last month is that people are uh, so literal about the categories. Like uh, one of the categories this year is a book with music in it. Someone put on our Facebook post, does it have to have actual music notes. And we're really soft on the rules on this. It just has to have music. It just has to have something in there. It could be about a band. It could be about a singer. It could have lyrics to a song. It could have, it could be about opera. It could be anything, fiction, nonfiction. It doesn't matter. It just needs to loosely fall into one of these categories. And Liza just put, they do not have to be read in order. We don't care what order they read them in. They just need to keep a log. And um, the log is how we know they've finished. Yep, they don't bring the log in until we're complete. We don't check it as they go, because that would be really time consuming for everyone involved. Something else that I need to really point out is this. You need to have book lists for every category. Uh, you need to have really strong readers advisory staff. Not only do we have the book list, but there are people who will just stop us and ask us, what is your favorite book about music? Or what did you read for this category? The third thing there is firm boundaries and soft boundaries. Um, yes, we're not going to fudge on the date. But if you want to read a book that has a line of music in it for that category, OK, that's fine. If you can justify putting in that category, we're good with that. Yes, Liza is right on on the chat there. We made books. We made reading logs for people the first year, thinking we would have a few sign up. You saw we had over 1,000 people signed up. So we don't make the reading logs any longer. Um, kindness and patience. People are so excited about this program. 
and we feel like we get asked the same about amount of uh, questions over and over, but we just still need to be kind and patient and enthusiastic as they are. Yes, we deal with this day in and day out, but these readers are so excited. Um, and it, there's, it's spreading around the country. We have people from, actually, we have someone in Ireland who has signed up for the program as well. Um, it's, it's so much fun to see it spread. The prizes, like I mentioned earlier, the hoodies seem to do the best. The bags, uh, I think we lost a lot of men, a lot of male participants in that part of it because they weren't interested in another bag. It was a nice bag. It was like an overnight bag. But um, it wasn't, it didn't appeal to men uh, or teens for that matter. And we have this fantastic Facebook group. Um, it's a closed group, so you have to be accepted in and you have to uh, kind of be vetted. We make sure that you're not selling something or you're not, it's not spam, you're not going to get anything you don't want to see in this Facebook group, but it's a lot of, hey, I'm reading this book, it can fall into these seven different categories, or I need help finding a book for this category, can anyone help me? It's a really supportive group. Um, and all these sweatshirt questions about sizes, we take sizes when they finish and when at the end of the program, like Vice is going to get to, um, we wait till the last day of the program, we tally everything up, and then we send the orders in. So we're not guessing. And we have samples at the desk so people can, you know, see what a medium looks like versus an extra large or vice versa. Um, the Facebook group. We have over 711 members in the group. Um, when we opened up, this year, the, or I'm sorry, when we started signing up for this year's program, we had 200 requests over the weekend just to join. Uh, we pay for the sweatshirt from our programming budget. Yes, and that's the best part, Liza, is just that, um, saying we don't sell leftovers, we don't buy extra. We only buy enough prizes for those people who finish the program. So if you see anyone with our Extreme Book Nerd book bag or sweatshirt, they read all of the books required. Um, any other questions? We love this program. It's so much fun. It's a lot of work. Um, I wish I had pictures of our book lists, um, that would have been great, but we do have book lists for every single category. So we have 50 book lists upstairs on our third floor desk. Um, the program is open to people outside of Idaho, except they don't get to win a prize. We had a lot of issues with that this year. People wanted to pay a prize fee. and. Um, Yes, you can pay a price fee. It's sixty-two fifty-four dollars a year to get it out of county library card, and that's pretty much how we've done it. Or we've encouraged them to talk to their local library directors, their local library board of trustees, um, and get a program like this going in their library. They can get donations. They can get um, help from their local friends groups or any other group to start a program like this. We're lucky enough to have a healthy programming budget. And yes, it is much bigger than we ever dreamed it would be. Yes, I know that Bozeman, Montana or Missoula, well, I just saw it somewhere. One of the two did a program like this and they, oh, yes, I think you're right, it was Missoula. They, uh, they sent us a Facebook message about it. Um, and other libraries do it. They don't always offer prizes. I have seen that. Um, it's kind of a personal challenge to yourself. We think we probably get more people involved in it because of the sweatshirt and the bragging rights of the prize. 
Really, how much time do I have left? Should I finish? Uh -huh. Thanks. Um, well, I think if if you got if you're done, I think we're ready to move yeah. on. But thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Catherine. Those were great, both great programs that uh, that work and are so cool, as Molly says. And there's Jennifer's uh, contact information if you want more information, or or Liza's information, and. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for sharing those. So now we're going to move on to our next presenter, Adult Programming That Works. And, the, and this is Diane Scott, who is coordinator for our Let's Talk About It program. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Let's Talk About It is a little bit different in that it is a grant program that libraries apply for, so it's not something that just any library can put out there um, the way we do it here in Idaho. So the ICFL awards these grants and libraries participate. I interviewed um, or, or um, kind of surveyed the libraries that seem to have the best attendance at the Let's Talk About It book discussions. And the things that they told me in, that they had in common about their attendance are on these next three slides. So first of all, they all agree that promotion is key that it's really important that the library have a good display and not only have a display up, but what they said is have their staff knowledgeable about the program so that staff is actually directing guests to the display and answering questions about how it works, how the program works. They also uh, typically put an ad in the local paper, do press releases, and they put posters all around town and we happen to provide those posters to the participating libraries, and so they can put them up at coffee shops, grocery stores, drug stores, whatever, so that that visual is kind of posted all around. Some of them talk about it on local radio shows. They blog on their website, use social media, email to their patrons, anything to get the word out about this program. Um, they often partner with local businesses and book clubs and friends of the library and other agencies. So for example, if they're doing a book theme on the Civil War, they partner with somebody like the Historical Society to um, spread the word, put it out in their newsletters, uh, basically just get the word out about the program and try to promote it. Um, if it's a food theme, book discussion, then they'll go to the local cafes, restaurants, and so forth, and again, just try to get the word out about the program. Uh, newsletter articles are great, flyers, brochures. They like to have brochures on their desk at the library so that patrons who come in can just pick one up and walk out with it and have that information with them. Um, and, and again, inform all the volunteers that are working in the library about the program, and volunteers can help spread the word. But the bottom line is they all agree that word of mouth is still the best advertising. So you want just as many people talking about it as possible to um, help get that promotion factor going. Uh, another thing that they all agreed on is that active participation by the library staff is investing in the success of the program. So um, the library person who's in charge of the program, the programmer or librarian or whoever, it's important that they stay in contact with the program leaders or the scholars in our case who are coming to talk about the book or lead a discussion, confirm the date, the time, make sure that that person has the location right, has directions how to get there, because you want it to start off without a hitch. Um, a lot of libraries offer treats for the group that's meeting to discuss, so they'll have coffee, tea, cho hot chocolate, cookies, cake, whatever. Um, some of them even do potlucks. So those are some ideas. Um, and then it's important that a library staff person actually attend and help encourage the discussion and provide kind of that welcoming environment rather than just turn it over to the, to the program um, guests and let them deal with it. So you want to have a staff person who's always there available. Um, it's also important, they said, to stress to participants that they attend all the sessions because that they are tied together with a, a theme. And so in order for the 
patrons to get the most out of that whole purpose of that theme and the, the uh, reason those books were chosen together is to attend all of the sessions and um, all of the discussions. And then ask your participants always to suggest what are um, things they would like to see in a similar program in the future so that they know that they have some input, that their voice is being heard. And then collect evaluations to get that input from patrons and participants as well so that, again, you can kind of gauge the success of the program and what you might want to do differently next time. And lastly, they all agreed to think outside the library box. So what about a Facebook streaming live event? I have one library that's thinking about doing that next time. Um, Adobe Connect or other meeting tools for remote attendance. And what about off-site opportunities? So here's an example. One very small mountain town actually has their book discussions at a local bar and restaurant. So it's books and beers, I think, is what they call it <laughs> sometimes. So depending on your audience, something like that might work. Or meeting at a coffee shop or you know, just taking it off the library site, meeting at the historical society or a museum or something like that. So, Again, think outside the box. How can you make it new, different, exciting, and interesting to the participants? Okay, so we have a question here um, that, uh, that we're asking, are we talking about a book club or a program brought in? Kind of sounds like either one, huh? Could be either one. The one I'm referring to, the Let's Talk About It, is a program that is brought in. The libraries borrow the books from the Idaho Commission for Libraries. We send them enough to check out to their patrons, and then we send a scholar out to do the book discussions, lead the book discussions. So that's the example I'm using here, but it could be any book club discussion that would, I think, um, need to use these same ideas and, and kind of boundaries or rules. Okay, thanks, Diane. You're welcome. If, if anyone has any other questions, please put them in the text chat box, and we will respond to them. Now we have with us um, Sue Walker, who is the coordinator for our Talking Book Service. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I know a lot of folks are familiar with the Talking Book Service, but because it has changed so much over the last 10 years, and also because public libraries especially play such an integral role in helping their community members learn about the service and also go ahead and get them signed up for it. I want to just go, run through it for you um, and feel free to ask questions in the text box. Okay, so um, the um, traditional um, talking book service, as a lot of people remembered, was all on cassettes, but we've come a long way uh, since then. Um, our audio books, and we have over 75,000 titles, are on, uh, they're all electronic, so their quality is very high. They're digital books. We have them audio, we have them braille, and we also now have an online um, database called BARD, where folks can go and actually download their books and play them not only on the player that the Talking Book Service provides, but also download them on other devices, such as their phones and their iPads and things like that. Can you hear me better now? In addition to the materials that we receive from the National Library Service, and we get about 3,000 titles a year that are recorded, we also have local studios um, here at the library, and we record books of local interest, things having to do with Idaho and the Pacific Northwest. If you run across titles about your region, your community, um, things that have been written, um, we always can consider those to uh, record them because we know there's a lot of local interest in what's going on in the state. We also at this point um, can provide an online catalog, which means people can go and search for materials. They can link directly to BARD to download those materials, or they also can go ahead and request that titles be sent to them. 
through the online catalog. So we provide a lot of ways for folks to find out what we have and also to go ahead and receive them. Talking Book Service users uh, get a variety of materials, and this is a statewide service. It's completely free to anybody who's eligible. First of all, they get books and magazines in audio or braille format, and we can provide both of those. Secondly, as long as they're using the program, they get an audio player, which um, they just keep, and the other the materials that they receive through the mail go back and forth free postage for the blind, but they keep the audio player as long as they're using the service. They get access to BARD and to the online catalog so that they can download materials or find what we have. Um, we mail everything to them, free postage for the blind, and it is returned to us the same way. And then we have a toll-free number for our reader's advisory. We have four staff here who work with our users to help them tailor the service to their needs and find those materials um, that best meet their needs. We have a question, Sue. Uh, what service do you use and how to record your local books? I will go ahead. I can get that back to you, um, Jennifer. Um, we do have um, professional, we have professional software, which Sheila Winther, our volunteer coordinator and studio manager, can give you the details on that. And so a big question is who, who qualifies? For this particular service. For a long time it was known as uh, Books for the Blind. However, there are other uh, conditions that would qualify you to use this service. Basically, if you cannot read standard print, so if you're legally blind, if you cannot read uh, standard print without other aids other than glasses, if you're physically unable to hold a book or turn the pages. So for example, you've had a stroke, you have some sort of degenerative disease such as Parkinson's, um, those folks are also eligible. Or if you're unable to read due to what they call an organic brain condition. And that can be you've had a stroke, your eyes still function, but your brain doesn't process the information. Some forms of dyslexia are also um, eligible for the service. Um, the brain condition one is one that it, we get a lot of questions on. Um, dyslex, some forms of dyslexia are um, eligible, stroke victims, brain injuries. Uh, the thing with this one to remember is that it needs to be certified by a medical doctor. And um, we get questions all the time from school psychologists, and unfortunately, it does need to be a medical doctor who does go ahead and certify that particular one. We have a question, what is the best way to contact the service? Um, we do have a toll-free number. Um, we have an email address. Um, we have a website that, that folks can go to to find out that contact information. But we want you to go ahead and help us spread information about this service. A lot of our users are older. They may tend to be um, isolated. And when they hear about the service, Sometimes they're very dubious. Is it really free? Is this some sort of a scam? And so it's very um, useful to have folks, especially folks who are using your library, see information about the service. We have brochures we can provide. We have posters we can provide. Plus, if they just hear from you that, yes, this is a real service, they're not going to start taking money from you, um, it's just very valuable. It also it's very helpful if you can go ahead and actually help them sign up. Every new user does need to be certified that they're eligible for the program. So if the person is legally blind, visually impaired, or physically impaired, uh, a library staff member can go ahead and sign them up. However, um, as I said earlier, if it is an organic brain dysfunction, it does need to be certified by a medical doctor. So to register users, um, you can go to our website and download an application. Um, it's a four-page application, but it's pretty basic information, um, probably would take about 10 minutes to complete. You can go ahead and certify the applicant uh, by completing that section on the bottom of page two, 
and then you can mail the application to us um, here at ICFL. We also can go ahead and provide um, application packets to you that actually have free postage envelopes right in them. Or you can just take and take, put the application in a regular envelope or where postage goes right, free, free postage for the blind. Um, do not seal it. Just tuck in the flap and it should come to us just fine. As I said, there's lots of ways you can help us market it. Right now, um, we are running a public service announcement, which hopefully some of you have seen on your TV or heard on your radio. We can provide posters. We can uh, provide brochures, um, application packets. Um, we're available to come out and talk to staff um, and actually show you how to use the player. We can give you a player and some demo tapes to use in-house. So if there, all of these materials can be ordered via our website. We do have a form there. Or if you have any questions, feel free to email me or to go ahead and give me a call here at the Commission. So there's my contact information. Thanks so much for helping us get word out about this wonderful um, program. And if you go to our website, you can see some of the comments that our clients have left about how much this means to them. And we just want to give everybody that opportunity to use this service. And, and I might say this, this talking book service is specific for the state of Idaho. But for those of you who are not from Idaho, you're somewhere in your state, your state library or your state library agency can put you in connection with your uh, own state's uh, talking book service, so to speak. So every state has at least one. Some have more. <laughs> so thanks, Sue. Any any other questions for Sue before we move to Amelia? Okay. So Amelia, are you with us still? I am. Okay. So Amelia, I'm go is going to talk to us a little bit about um, grant opportunity that is available for. Idaho libraries, uh, there are various ways that you might get involved. So take it away. Thank you. And I apologize if I do sound like I'm in a tunnel. Uh, I will try to speak slowly and clearly uh, to um, account for that. It, I, it also sounds like there might be some folks from other states on this phone call. And for those folks, um, I would just say that even though this is an Idaho grant opportunity, um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is a nationwide statute, and so there will be um, or have been uh, similar grant competitions in every state um, this spring. Um, so you might want to reach out to your adult education agency in your state if you're interested um, in what might be happening there. So, I wanted to let you all know about a funding opportunity that's taking place across Idaho this spring. A full in-depth webinar will be taking place this Wednesday, February 15th, um, and the link for that information will be at the end of the slides today. Um, you're also welcome to attend that webinar if you'd like more information. Today I want to provide you with a high-level overview of our grant so you can get a sense of whether you'd like to apply or perhaps reach out to other organizations in your community who may be applying and with whom you might want to pursue a partnership. The purpose of this grant competition is to identify and fund providers for our federal adult education program. Our primary funding stream will be for large-scale programs, and we'll be seeking providers at the regional level for those. However, we will also be accepting applications for smaller or locally-based programs under two additional funding opportunities. We're interested in providing this information and opportunity to our community libraries because we think that libraries play an important role as partners in making these programs successful whether as grant recipients or as community partners. In this presentation, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about this federally funded grant program and an overview of the three funding streams for which grants are available, as well as a summary of who is eligible to apply. 
All right. Um, so the funds for this grant are authorized under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014, also known as WIOA or WIOA. Funds are distributed to the states through the U.S. Department of Education, and the state that administers these funds in Idaho is Idaho Career and Technical Education. Because Idaho receives very limited funds uh, from the feds, which do also carry a high amount of compliance, our priority will be to support ongoing and holistic programs. Funds are not really intended for one-time projects or single-purpose purchases. Applicants who are selected for funding will receive annual grants for a period of two years to support their program. And they may continue to receive annual funding after that point if they remain in good standing. Applications for this grant will be due on March 15th of 2017, and we anticipate that funding decisions will be made sometime in May. At this point, I'd like to provide some definitions as to what constitutes adult education for the purpose of this grant. Adult education generally comprises two types of instruction. The first, which has a somewhat redundant name, is adult education and literacy. And the second is English language acquisition. Both strands of instruction are intended to help adult students age 16 or older improve their skills for the purposes of getting their high school equivalency, getting ready for college, finding a job, or improving their job. In some programs, these two strands of instruction may be blended or contextualized to provide a holistic approach to student skill building. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the definition of each of these, but you can kind of see the high-level overview of what those two types of instruction entail on this slide. In Idaho, we will be supporting three types of adult education programs. Uh, which comes out to be three different funding streams. For ease of reference throughout the application materials, these funding streams have been labeled according to the section of the law where they're authorized. The first funding stream, called Section 231, is for regional adult education programs. This is a funding stream that's going to support the primary regional providers of adult education. The next funding stream, called 225, is for programs that provide adult education to incarcerated or institutionalized adults. And the third funding stream, called Section 243, is for programs that provide integrated English literacy and civics education. So now I'm going to just touch on, get a little bit deeper into each of these funding streams to give you an idea of what they're all about. The purpose of Section 231 funding is to support a single regional provider for each of Idaho's six service delivery regions. The selected grantee will be expected to provide adult education and literacy services to the entire region. In regions with significant populations of English language learners, grantees will also be expected to provide English language acquisition as well. So this map uh, shows the counties that are contained in each of those six regions to give you an idea of where you might be. Although a local library might not be interested in becoming the sole regional adult education provider for their area, we do encourage libraries to reach out to their regional provider once those have been selected or even during the application phase to discuss applying as a consortium or forming a partnership. Local libraries play a very crucial role in reaching the many rural, isolated, and small communities throughout Idaho where adults may need to access these adult education services, and this makes libraries very important partners in every region. So it, um, if you are interested in forming those types of partnerships, please do reach out to me. I would be happy to put you in touch with the, the regional provider in your area. The purpose of Section 225 funding is to select one or more grantees who can provide adult education services specifically for adults who are incarcerated or institutionalized. 
And the state may award multiple grants under this funding stream, depending on the number and quality of applications we receive. The state will consider applications for programs of various sizes, including statewide programs, as well as programs that take place in a single facility or location. And for the purposes of this grant, services must be provided to criminal offenders and must take place in a correctional institution. You do not need to be a correctional institution to uh, qualify for this grant. It's just that your services need to take place in a correctional institution. And finally, the purpose of Section 243 funding is to provide integrated English literacy and civics education. These are services that enable participants to achieve competency in the English language and to acquire the basic and some of the more advanced skills that they'll need to be able to function effectively as parents, workers, and citizens of the United States. Eligible programs must also provide access to an integrated education and training program which we'll get a bit more into on the full webinar on Wednesday. Grants under this funding stream will be available in the southern and eastern regions that have a high number of English language learners. The state may consider and award grants to multiple applicants in each region, uh, depending on the number and the quality of the applications we receive. So far, I've talked a little bit about the types of activities and programs that will be supported with grant funds. So now I want to briefly discuss the types of entities who are eligible to apply for and receive funds. The law states that any entity of demonstrated effectiveness can apply, uh, and it gives some examples of what those entities might be. Uh, you see that library is highlighted uh, about halfway down the list here. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. And it's also important to know that um, groups of eligible applicants may come together to apply as a consortium. Uh, it doesn't have to be a single entity that applies on its own. So what exactly does the law mean when it says demonstrated effectiveness? In short, it means that any entity has to have a history and experience providing adult education. Um, it also means that they have to be able to provide data or evidence that they have such a history. Entities or organizations that lack experience in adult education are not eligible to apply. So in other words, these are not funds that are intended for startup organizations. However, we will consider funding new or expanded activities that are carried out by applicants who do have a strong history of adult education. So as I said at the beginning of this presentation, this is very high level information about the grant. Um, the full set of materials for applications, instructions, and background can be found at our website, which is listed here. You're also welcome to reach out to me directly um, if you do have any questions. Um, the information for this Wednesday's webinar can also be located on this website. Um, and so uh, I know that we are at the end, end of our time. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has any questions, um, but I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions that folks may have, or you're welcome to reach out to me directly. Um, and that is all the information I have this time. Thanks, Amelia. I see a couple of people typing, so we'll see if there's uh, some additional questions. Um, phew, we made it. We made it through all of our presenters, and, and I want to thank all of our presenters for um, sharing their information today. This, this was a jam-packed session. It will, the, uh, today's session is archived, and um, we'll, I'll be putting it out on Live Idaho. Um, it will be, if you go to libraries.idaho.gov, continuing education, you'll be able to, to find the info to go page and the connection for that information there. Um, so if there are no further questions for any of our presenters, um, I would say that is the end of our adult programming. Uh, next uh, month's program is on Makerspace Communities and Their Future. It will be an encore presentation by Amy Vecchione, uh, who presented it, the same presentation last fall at ILA. Uh, so that'll be on March 6th 
at 12.30 Mountain Time, 11.30 Pacific Time. Thank you all for joining us today, and thank you to all of our presenters.